So welcome, Chef. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so my plan was to first sort of introduce the restaurant, which I have in, in, in Sweden, and talk a little bit about what we do. And then I was going to go sort of more deeply into how we work with vegetables, how we grow them and how we store them. Um, that was my plan. So maybe I can skip that. Probably people know where Sweden is. So. But that's where Fabiken is, at least. You see, I usually say that it's in the northern parts of Sweden, but it's actually kind of in the middle, sort of towards the Norwegian border. Um, this is what we are. We are a tiny, tiny restaurant. We have like 12 to 16 people dining five nights a week. It's an ambitious restaurant. And what we try to do up there is to make the most out of whatever possibilities we have, and difficulties as well, for that matter, um, which um, uh, manifests sort of foremost because we, um, we uh, only work with products from this area. Um, and this area is uh, very interesting because it's, um, sorry, because it's, um, it has inland climate where we are. It's uh, hot in the summer and very cold winters. And then if you just cross the Scandinavian mountain ranges, it's very close to us. Then you get to Norway, we have coastal climates. So you have a lot of different things, a lot of diversity within a, within a very small region. Um, and this is a question that I very often get. So why do you work with products from a certain area only? Why don't you work with products from all over the world? And uh, the answer to that is very simple. It's actually just quality. And our products, they are really, really good. It's the best products that I've ever worked with anywhere in any restaurant. And it's not because they are from the region as such, because products don't get better from just because they are from a certain place. Mm -hmm. But it's, it gets much better uh, because we can have a cooperation. We can have a dialogue with all the people that produces our food to the restaurant. We can give them feedback and they can tell us what's, what works for them and not, and we can support each other, which, which um, uh, brings progress and development. Another question that I get very often, why do you have so few seats? Why is the restaurant so tiny, especially now when we're quite a well-known restaurant? We could probably fill it uh, many times over every night. Uh, but that's something that has never really appealed to me because I like the format. I like cooking myself. I, I don't like to train a, a huge team to do my work. Um, and also, I like the dining experience that we can give people, which is sort of a communal dining experience. It starts at 7, everyone arrives at the same time. Then we uh, do a little bit of matchmaking, we put people together, they sit together for drinks for half an hour, um, and some appetizers, and then we move people upstairs, and you have your own separate tables, like in any restaurant. But the difference then is that everyone will have the same menu at the same time, at the same pace. So everyone will kind of share this experience and then be seated again, um, seated again downstairs in front of the fireplace afterwards. So this is uh, our business. We employ 11 people in total, seven of them work in the kitchen and the rest in front of the house or with the hotel which we have. It's a six room hotel so it's also very small. One of my chefs is responsible for all the produce. He more or less does only that because it takes a lot of work to get all the stuff into the restaurant. Um, not only um, uh, to get the quality, but actually to get enough of it, because even if the restaurant is tiny, we do like we serve about three thousand people a year, and everyone would have sort of in between twenty or twenty five servings, uh, so it makes up slightly over sixty thousand plates a year, which is quite quite a lot actually uh, the number of the sort of um, uh, how the uh, work hours in the restaurant is uh, split between the different things we do is also very different from other restaurants because in most other restaurants, people will work with cooking only. That will be like, it will be like 90% cooking and 10% cleaning. But with us it's 50% working with the produce before the cooking starts, which is a lot of work hours and a lot of money for us, it's a tiny business. And this is mainly uh, spent on getting the produce in, driving around, talking to people, developing our relations with the community and getting all the produce into the, to the farm and also working with the storage techniques that I'm going to talk later about. So that was a little bit about the restaurant as such. This is how we work the vegetable year at Fabiken. Um, <clears throat> so if you start from the bottom, you see two blue lines, and they show when in the year we use a lot of, use a lot of foraged vegetables, because this is something that people um, always put together with restaurants from my area. There's always like a big focus on forage right now, which is not always the case. It's just during a few, few, few brief moments in a year. So you see there in May and June, that's the only really time where we actually, actually work with uh, foraged vegetables and foraged herbs, just for like six weeks maximum when they are young and tender in the spring. And then during midsummer, we don't really do that anymore because they're not delicious anymore. Then 
and, and, and there is really no need because there's so, so much other things as well going on. And then the forage stuff, it comes back again in August, and then it's not herbs and vegetables anymore. Then there's mushrooms and berries mainly, and it continues all through uh, autumn and finishes in early winter, which is more or less now. The red line, it marks the time when we actually have fresh vegetables from the garden, like most restaurants would have every day of the year nowadays because you transport things all around the place. Uh, for us, it's quite brief, and we try to make the most out of that time. So during that time in the summer, everything is about showing the produce in their sort of purest, freshest form. So we can have like a chef running down to the vegetable garden, picking some peas, and more or less like popping the pods straight on the plate and just serving them. Whilst then, <coughs> in the winter, if you look at the green line, uh, which um, shows the time of the year when we have to use things that are stored or prepared in a way to keep, um, it's all about something else because all those storage techniques, no matter which you choose to, to use, they, uh, they will do something to the product. It will make them sort of less of a product. The, the carrot will be less of a carrot because you store it. It will be different. And uh, that's something that we have sort of tried to embrace and to, uh, to incorporate into the cooking during the winter. So it gives a very special flavor and a very special character to everything we do in a large part of the year. This is uh, about one kilometer from the restaurant. And this is quite typical how the grounds would look like where we um, would forage in the spring and early summer. Um, so you see there's like in the valley you would have coniferous forest and then quite quickly as, uh, as the elevation goes up it um, sort of thins out and you have more of this uh, low shrubs and, and uh, a lot of lichens. This is a little list of uh, different wild vegetables that we uh, often use in the restaurants. And um, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these because there are so many, but if someone would be, have a special interest in this, you can just email the restaurant and I'll, I'll send it back to you. So. The vegetable gardens, this is something that I'm very, very proud of. It was uh, the first year, which is now five years ago, that I worked at Fabiken. I sort of started a little vegetable plot. And um, it was just by sort of 20 square meters or something like that. And I grew uh, some onions, some carrots, some beets, uh, a few uh, sweet peas for the summer, and a few more things. And I kind of realized that it's the ultimate way of seeing to you that you have the best possible vegetables available to you. Because uh, you can influence so many things just by choosing different, um, uh, different uh, growing techniques and different varieties of vegetables. And a carrot is not just a carrot, there's like hundreds of varieties. And uh, within those varieties, you can also affect the end result so much by when you harvest them, harvest them or how you grow them. Two different photos from the same place. One is in early spring when everything is sort of on its way up, and then one is about this time of year when the first snow has arrived. This is how it would look like in the summer. This is probably around July last year. Um, <clears throat> this is how the vegetable gardens are laid out. We, uh, for me also, like they're much larger now than when I started. They grow a little bit every year, like become larger and larger. And that's mainly because for me, gardening is like, it's a work in progress. It's a learning process, the whole thing, because there's so many things to uh, try to understand and to learn. So we just add on. As soon as I find something interesting, we just add on a new section. And, and at this point, we have, if you look to the left of the image, there's something where it's labeled four part crop rotation which is four raised beds in which we grow four different kinds of um, uh, plants that take different nutrients out of the soil to grow and that has uh, different sensitivities for viruses and other uh, dangerous microorganisms. And um, we rotate them every year um, to, to prevent buildup of those organisms, microorganisms and to prevent depletion of soil nutrients. This is how that one looks. It's quite straightforward. This is like any home garden, actually, this one. Uh, the white stuff on top, that's just to prevent the young seedlings from frost in the summer. We take those off in like mid-June. In the middle, we have a different system, which is labeled the six-part crop rotation, which is raised and covered beds. And that also has drip irrigation. And this is a more intense way of farming the land. It gives uh, us the um, possibility to raise the soil temperature, because we um, we uh, see that black stuff. It's a black cloth which you cover the soil in, and that prevents. Um, uh, first, it prevents moisture to evaporate, but it also raises the soil temperature. So we are basically instead of having a subarctic climate, we are 
somewhere like in the south of Sweden or Denmark, where we have a much more temperate, temperate climate. Um, so here, every uh, crop grows from its own little hole, which is also, um, uh, it's a lot of work to do this in spring, to, to actually plant everything and to set it up, but then it's very good because you don't have to spend a lot of time cleaning out weeds and, and things like that. Uh, but this is actually, we've seen, we followed this now, we've done this for three years, and we followed it, and we see that we actually uh, are not able to um, put back all the nutrients in the soil again that we take out, because this is so intense, it, it really produces a lot of vegetables. Um, and because we don't use heavy machinery, it's all turned by hand and it's all um, uh, transported by hand, we have a hard time putting back all the uh, organic nutrients in the soil again, which is sooner or later we're going to have to change this practice and do something else. And then we have my favorite down on the right part, which is sort of in between those ones. It's a three-part crop rotation. 30% of it is grown with leguminous plants, which are not harvested, but instead just uh, plow down in the soil every autumn. So you give back, because leguminous plants, they have a um, bacteria growing on the roots, which uh, has the ability to fix nitrogen from the, oxygen, uh, from, from the atmosphere. And you turn that down every autumn and let it rot into the soil, and that's giving back organic nutrients. And this one is not covered with cloth either, it's covered with grass clippings, which sort of, it sort of serves the same purpose, but it's much nicer in most ways. The herb gardens look like that. The red building is the restaurant. Um, the kitchen will be sort of in the middle, and then the higher part in the back, that's where the dining room is on the second floor. The herb gardens is where we produce all the fresh sort of flowers and herbs for the summer, but also everything that we dry and store for the winter in terms of seasoning and herbs. And this is the choice that my, one has to do every time when one decides to, um, to uh, store a vegetable. Because there's basically two different schools of techniques. Either you utilize um, some kind of mechanism already present in the plant that makes it sort of keep for a long time, uh, or you kill the plant off and everything within a restricted atmosphere around the plant. Um, the techniques that kill the plant, they kill all the harmful bacteria, as I said, in the restricted atmosphere. And that can be, for example, that you take a carrot and you put it in a jar, uh, you fill the jar with some brine or water or something, and then heat treat the jar, like you bring it to 90 degrees and keep it at 90 degrees for at least 10 minutes. And that will uh, kill or uh, disable all, almost all microorganisms within that jar. And it can be other examples of that, for example, pickles, it's sort of also, also a killing technique. Uh, the non-killing ones that are interesting in the way that uh, they use mechanism already um, uh, present in the plant, and that is, for example, all root vegetables that we use, like carrots and beets and, uh, and things like that, they are biennials. And basically, their life cycle is that the first year they will sprout from a seed and they will grow during summer. They will um, collect a lot of um, energy through photosynthesis and storage as chemical energy in the root in the form of carbohydrates. Um, <coughs> And that's the energy we consume. That's sort of what we, what we want to use in, in the vegetable. And because of this, basically it does this just because it wants to get ahead in the, in the sort of race of life. Because next spring, when it's like dormant during one winter, it will um, be able to uh, sprout a flower, a flower before all the, uh, all the one year herbs, since it doesn't have to wait for the photosynthesis to really get going in the spring. It can just go straight away and consume the energy it has in the root. And this is something we can use. If we just harvest, it at, harvest the plant at the right time, when it's set on hibernation, when it's sort of decided to go hibernate in, in, for winter, uh, we can harvest it and we can store it in, a, in an environment which is um, similar to the temperature and the humidity in the soil. It can be a root cellar or something like that. And this is something that I find very interesting, and this took me a while to actually figure out, that all the methods to prolong the shelf life or to, to sort of store vegetable, it never makes them better, it just makes them different. And as I said before, a carrot is never better as a carrot than when it was just taken out of the soil and eaten. But everything you do with that carrot after you pick it and sort of take the first bite, it will make it less of a carrot. Um, which is not always uh, a bad thing, but it's a fact. So here's a few specific techniques. So, so this is uh, how we can keep, for example, broccoli, kale, and cabbage in the winter garden, because many of the brassicas 
they produce um, uh, different um, uh, agents in them that keep them from freezing. They contain a lot of sugars and sometimes even a little bit of alcohol. Um, and they keep on metabolizing, even though they have degree, they are frozen, they keep on metabolizing just a little bit. So they actually, it's very fascinating because if you take a broccoli like that, that you left, left in the garden on the plant that has been frozen for like one and a half months, and you harvest it and you take it into your kitchen, it's still a fresh broccoli when it defrosts. But if you take the same broccoli and you freeze it for one and a half months and you defrost it in the kitchen, then it's a frozen broccoli. That's, I find that very fascinating. And this, this, this we, you, we, we just leave like all those brassicas in the garden and we keep on harvesting them until they run out or until the moose eat them all. Uh, clamping. So this is a way of using that mechanism that I talked about earlier, the, uh, the biennial thing. Uh, and this is probably the first way that we humans store vegetables in any efficient sort of manner. Um, and basically what you do is that you harvest all your roots, you bring them closer to your house, and you make this sort of a few uh, trenches, and then you put some, some straw between the trenches. You put all the root vegetable there, cover it with more straw to insulate it, and then you cover it with soil. Um, and this will keep a very, very steady um, temperature over winter, because those vegetables that are set on hibernation, they're not dead, they're still metabolizing. So they actually consume a little bit of energy and produce a little bit of heat. Uh, so they will keep in there from, from freezing, even in our subarctic climates. Um, and also the humidity, because it's placed straight on the soil, it will keep very, very steady and level all through winter, which is important when you store vegetables. The only problem with this is that you can't really just take one. You have to take them all out of there when you break it in the winter, which is, can be slightly impractical. And that's why you have the cellar, the root cellar, which is, in my opinion, one of the best ways of storing vegetables. It, it works with the same principle. You keep a very um, steady and level temperature. It's dark, and you have the same humidity as the plant would experience in its growing environment. Inside the root cellar, we, root cellar, we would store our root vegetables like this, buried in sand. The sand helps preventing um, fluctuations in temperature and humidity even more, so you get an even more level climate for the vegetables. Other things which are not roots, like for example cabbage, they are strictly not speaking biennials, but they have some of those functions anyway because it's just about surviving for them. Because if they would not flower the first summer, they would be able to, under certain circumstances, survive until next summer and continue the life then. And that's something we also can use. So we can harvest the cabbage when it's, uh, when it's ripe. We can put it in the cellar and leave it for that after about like six or eight weeks. It will dry, it looks like parchment paper on the outside, it will be like a little skin. And then after, after uh, maybe, uh, I would say, um, two more months, it's all moldy. It looks horrible. And it looks like something you would throw out your fridge straight away if you found it there. Uh, but in fact, is that you just take that skin off, there will still be a fresh and healthy cabbage on the inside, because it's layered, it, it's layered you know. And those layers, they protect the layer underneath from damage from bacteria because the bacteria have to tra like travel around each bend in the layers. So it's a very long way to go for them. Um, and if you keep them all through winter, new little tiny cabbages will start sprouting from the rootstock. Oh yeah, the leak machine. Um, <clears throat> I read a report from uh, the Swedish University of Agriculture a few years ago uh, that was basically said that you could store leaks for up to 290 days if you had the perfect surrounding, like the perfect environment for them. And that was 90% of humidity and 0 0.1 degrees. Um, and you can store them for 290 days without significant loss of quality, which is very interesting to me. Um, you have the very, very high humidity to keep them from drying out, and you have the very low temperature to slow down their metabolism, so they don't really change that much. So what I did was that I bought a domestic freezer and I uh, tampered with the thermostat so it keeps 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 degrees Celsius and I filled it with a little bit of sand and I harvested all the leaks and then replanted them in the sand again. <laughs> and then I left it all through winter. And this is, I stood there so long so that all the other people working on the estate, they like just saw it as a sort of a permanent installation there in the corner. So it was just covered. When we used the leaks in the spring, this was how it looked. It was just covered in all kinds of crap. Um, onions and garlic, they can be dried. Um, most, most times when you buy onions and garlics, the, the leaves have been cut when they were still green, and then you can never store them for more than like maybe two months, because as soon as you cut them there, you will have an entryway for mold spores and bacteria. Uh, but if you just leave them, 
like those garlics lying out, exposed to UV, radi UV radiation, um, they will die and they will seal themselves off and they will wait for next summer. So then when the leaves are dry, then you can cut them. You can store them for a very long time in a dry and cool environment. It's just, basically, you can store them for like two years. Pasteurizing is one of those techniques that will kill the plant and also everything else in a surrounding area. Uh, these tomatoes, they are um, pasteurized in brine and it's a technique that were very, very common in households just until like 50 or 60 years ago and then people just stopped because it was so easier to buy, you know, people started having domestic freezers and things like that, so it was much easier to buy the produce from a supermarket. Uh, but it's a very good technique, it produces an excellent result. It can be a little bit dangerous because of um, bacteria that can survive in there, which are Clostridium botulinum, which gives botulism, which will result in, the, in, in you being dead if you eat them. Um, but it can be avoided very easily um, by respecting a few very simple rules. And one is that you can either keep the pH level under 3.84, because then they just cannot grow, and that can be done by adding something acidic. Uh, you can keep the temperature under 4 degrees at all times after the cooking, um, and that will keep them from growing as well. Or if you're uncertain that you have sort of been able to, to do those two uh, factors, uh, you can also heat the product before eating it again. You can heat it to 80 degrees and keep it there for five minutes and that will destroy all toxins as well. Pickling vinegar is a very, very safe method of uh, preservation and it works by lowering the pH level by adding some kind of chemical agent, for example, vinegar or lemon juice or whatever. Uh, very few bacteria can grow in a sour and, or acid environment. Pickling by lactobacillus fermentation. It works sort of in the same way, but instead of adding a chemical, uh, you try to make the lactobacillus already present thrive. And that's usually done by adding salt, which kind of um, uh, suppresses other bacteriological activity, which gives the lactobacillus an unfair advantage. And then they start, multi start growing. And, and consume, by consuming um, carbohydrates, they also produce uh, lactic acid, which lowers the pH level under 3.84 in quite a, quite a short period of time. And this can also be a little bit risky, because if, you, if it takes too long, you can have the same problem as with the, with the pasteurized foods, that you have other bacteria growing in there as well, and that would probably be E. coli or Clostridium botulinum, which are not good, any of them. Uh, drying herbs and mushrooms is something we do quite a lot as well. And what's important when you dry is to dry very, very quickly and in a cool temperature. Because if you dry them in an oven, you know, they taste like hay. They, taste, or they all taste the same, no matter what you do. If you dry them in room temperature in your room, they decay so much from enzymatic breakdown, so you kind of transform the flavor a lot. Like if you dry mushrooms at room temperature for a week, they taste like soy almost. If you do it with herbs, they lose all the green, green color and all those fresh aromas. So we use one of these, which is just a, sort of an industrial grade uh, dehydrator. It takes about 15 liters of water away from the atmosphere per hour. We keep it in a room, which is uh, more or less airtight, and it enables us to, uh, to dry out about 10 kilos of herbs in more or less two hours at 18 degrees Celsius, which preserves all the very, very fragile aromas and all the beautiful color. Using antibacterial properties, natural present in plants, um, is something that is also very, it's an interesting way of working that we haven't used that much. And on the photo you will have some lingonberries. Lingonberries are naturally very high in benzoic acid, which is something that the food industry would add to food to prevent mold from growing. Um, and basically what you can do is you can take lingonberries, put them in a jar, cover them with water, and then keep them for years. They never go bad. And they change very little in texture and flavor as well, which is interesting. Uh, you can also put things in there. You can put like half a cabbage in the box with lingonberries, and it will also keep for like two years without much, having, uh, much happening with it, except that it's pink in the end, obviously. <laughs> um, leguminous plants, something that we use a lot, it's very versatile. You can use them from like the first little sprout in spring in a salad uh, to um, fresh uh, beans and, uh, peas and uh, beans in the summer, and then all the way to uh, using um, the mature crop, which has been dried, uh, trashed, and stored for a long time. Uh, or um, as here, fermented, like to do with uh, miso, for example, in many of the Asian countries. Um, basically, what we do is that we have a dried brown bean or pea, which is steamed for a long time to kill any other bacteria or uh, mold growing on it. 
and then we infect it with uh, a particular mold which is called Aspergillus orisei, which um, when it grows, it uh, produces an enzyme that breaks down protein into uh, glutamic acid, which is very savory and delicious. So that will be like miso in the end, but with, not with soybeans, but with other beans. That was it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Definitely the most unique chef we've had here. Did, <laughs> no, seriously, but how did you get started with this process? I mean, when uh, you opened your restaurant, did you have all know. these things in place? or? No, 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 definitely not. But many of them, I, I saw them being used when I grew up in this area, which uh, um, has been very good at keeping its sort of old traditions. And I never learned them back then, but I saw them and I kind of got interested in them and started learning about them, yeah. started implementing them in, a, in our environment. Yeah, so is your restaurant pretty much 100% sustainable? Um, depends on how you see it. Our customers are not, because most of our customers, they fly in from all over the world. So. <laughs> okay, that's a good yeah. answer. Um, so I ask every chef that comes to Google this question, what do you think the kitchen of the future is going to be like in, let's say, 50 years? Are we going to be only cooking on electric? Or what, what do you think? Well, I already cook on electric, actually. But okay. um, I, I think that's like, it's obviously impossible to answer. And I think you can only say what you hope for it to be. And I hope for it to be much more diverse than it is today. I hope for people to look more within what they have in their area, to be more focused on what possibilities and difficulties they have and what really interests them, rather than looking on what everyone else is doing. Because that's something that's very common today. Yeah, good answer. So I heard that you actually didn't want to start a restaurant when you, before you started this. Is that correct? Uh, for a while, I stopped cooking. Yeah. Okay. So I, and I started wine. Okay. And so why did you decide to go back and do this? Because I, had, I um, so basically I, I lived in France for a while and then I moved back to Sweden and I stopped cooking because it was uh, uh, not so pleasant. <laughs> it was it, everything I did looked like what my former boss did, but less good because I was less good than him and. Uh, the produce I had at hand was much less good than what he had in France. Um, so it led to I stopped cooking and I started studying wine because I, my idea was to become a wine writer. And after finishing that, I started. I was um, offered a three-month job at Faviken, um, working with the family who owns the estate, to um, more or less just work with their wine cellar and buy some wine, teach them how to administer the wine cellar, and then go on. And then I kind of sort of. Stayed. <laughs> so I heard that you wrote the book in a very short amount of time, four months. Is I, I kind that? of started a little bit earlier, but okay. then you know, no, it was uh, it was very interesting. I had a lot of things that I wanted to say, apparently. So okay, yeah, it's a beautiful book. By Thank the way, you. So. All right, well, I want to open the um, open it up to Googler questions. So please, if you have a question, step up to the mic. Don't all rush at the same time, please. <laughs> all fifteen of you. Yeah. <laughs> So since you're a wine guy, I mean, wine and beer are just essentially ways of also kind of storing um, Definitely. Uh, foods. So do you have plans of kind of going in that direction as well? It's funny you're asking because I actually just bought a brewery like two months ago. <laughs> and it's being dismantled right now and it's going to be shipped to Faviken. And this winter we're going to learn how to use it. And then next year we, I already ordered the barley that we're going to plant and grow. And yeah, hopefully it's going to be a very interesting learning process. So you're very focused on um, cooking locally and eating locally, but what is it about uh, the area around Pavacan that you find most exciting? I don't know. I think it's like, I, I find it exciting because uh, I grew up there. I spent a lot of, like a large part of my life there, and I thought I knew everything about it. And then when I got back after being away a while and started working there, and starting working this way, I kind of realized that I knew very little about this area. And there's still so much left to understand and to discover and to learn about, which is fascinating. Thanks. So um, you told us a lot about vegetables, but uh, what's your approach to uh, fish and meat? Um, so that's like two more talks, but I can just do it very, very, very briefly. Um, with the fish, all the fish that we work with it comes from the same company, it's family owned and it's on the coastline of Norway, about two hours from the restaurant. Um, all the fish is caught on hook and line and we work with species that are red listed, which is slightly controversial today in restaurants, uh, because I think that the problem is not the fact that there's very little of some fish, the problem is the way that they are fished. 
And I like to support this company, which fishes in a way that if everyone fished like them, we would have very little of the problems we have with the world's fish stocks today. Uh, so we work with them. Um, and then we uh, work with uh, a few small fishery businesses in the area as well as supply freshwater fish. For meat, all the meat comes from people we know. There are a few farms that we work with in the area. Uh, we have sheep on the estate. And I also live on a farm where I have sheep, poultry and bees. So some of the stuff comes from there as well. Um, and what's different in the way that we work with meat is that we only buy whole animals and we buy them when they're alive. We pay the farmer when he has something he calls me and we go there, either me or someone else from the kitchen. We look at the animal and then we decide if we're going to buy it or not. And if we buy it, we buy it there and then. And that's about six months before it goes to the slaughterhouse. Uh, and then we pay them a premium to, um, to take care of the animal in a way that we like in the end. And then we take it to the slaughterhouse and we take care of that whole logistical process to secure the quality that we want. So I love your whole approach. What does your restaurant look like in a year? Are you going to be doing more covers? Or no, it's going to be the same, cards? but it's going to be much better. So. Okay. <laughs> and, and how is it going to be better? Uh, there's still, like, we, we've developed during the last two or three years, we developed a system which we work within, um, which I'm finally quite happy with. You know, the format and logistical system surrounding the restaurant, the way we work with produce and all that stuff. And now, sort of, the really funny part has sort of just begun, and that's when we start to develop within this system. So that's going to be uh, very interesting. There's so much to do yet. Yeah, so. yeah very impressive. Yeah. Do you have any uh, favorite restaurants in San Francisco? I've never been to San Francisco. I came this uh, like midday today, <laughs> and I'm going into the city tonight. But I'm going to cook at Qua the okay. day after Very tomorrow. Good. Where was that? Qua, uh, oh, okay. which is going to be very interesting. So I've never been to California before. Welcome. It came in a good week. So. So what are some of your favorite restaurants in America? Do you have any? Oh, well, that's so difficult to answer, you know. There are so many good restaurants, and they're so different from each other. So I don't really have a good answer there. Okay. Mm. It seems like you really pride yourself on being different, and you said strange, uh, and not, not really looking out uh, at, at other people and how that, what they're doing. So what is your creative process like, and where do you get your kind of new ideas from? I think that... Uh, the most important thing when you work in any professional craft where there's amount, uh, an amount of creativity involved um, is to master your skills, like to really, really understand and master your techniques that you use um, because that enables you to be, at least enables me to be intuitive. And that's how I work, like the creative process is very intuitive. And then I might get interested in a subject and I just go all in for that and I like contact all the people that know the most about this subject and I start research, researching it myself and I start uh, working with it and trying to understand it. But that's not for me the creative part, that's just sort of creating the tool or producing the tool to be creative in the end. That was a very strange answer, but anyhow. <laughs> so how hard is it to get into your restaurant? Uh, we take reservations 90 days ahead at the maximum. So okay. um, if you want to come to a restaurant, just sort of hang on the lock when the reservation is open. It shouldn't be much of a problem. Okay. All right, great. Well, any more questions? Okay, uh, he'll be up here to sign the books if uh, anyone wants their cookbook signed. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>